Welcome to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Good morning. Good morning, Arizona. This is AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection, with a very important subject today. And it is called Kinship Care in Arizona. Kinship Care in Arizona. And we are joined by several guests today. Uh, let me start to my left, Lori Divine. What a last name you have. I've always, every time I see it, I says, wow, Divine. <laughs> Lori Devine is an advocate for kinship care, and thank you for being here. Uh, we also have uh, Ursula Garza, and Ursula is a state kinship specialist for the Department of Child Safety. So you're representing the government. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to my right, I have uh, Brenda Gloria, and she's a kinship caregiver. I've seen you a long time, for many years, actually. Yes, we do. Yeah, so welcome. Thank you. Yeah. And also to my right, Aurelia Gracia Alinea. You're a kinship caregiver. Thank you for being with us. So I've successfully raised a grandchild. And um, so, yes, I have experience in kinship care. Perfect. Uh, we will be addressing several issues. This is, this is a, both um, a difficult subject um, and it also involves, uh, I would say, a work of love uh, because... Um, we have many, many uh, thousands of uh, children who, for various reasons, are not able to be taken care of by the parents. So family uh, relatives step in and uh, basically take uh, care, you know, take the, the care of these uh, ch children, sometimes informally so, and many, many times, well, actually more, more times informally yeah. and less times formally. And we'll explain all those concepts. So let me uh, ask the first question. Help us understand the concept of kinship, uh, kinship care. What is it, in both, both in terms of what's happening with our families and how the government kind of steps in, and not only the government, but also family members. Can you paint a picture of kinship care? Maybe some people have never heard of this term before. Okay, so that, that's a really, really big question. Um, first of all, uh, Kinship care is occurring when, for some reason, a relative is raising up their other relative's children, typically grandparents raising grandchildren. We have thousands of those in Arizona, don't we? So just to give you an idea, it's, this is a hard population to nail down, but um, I saw some recent data from 2016 from uh, some type of census uh, data they did, and it said that they had, in here in Arizona, 66,507 grandparents who are raising their grandchildren. So this is just grandparents. Do uh, you, you think those are households? Can we say those are households? Because in some instances you have both grandparents. Yes. So households. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that is the University of Phoenix Stadium where the mm -hmm. Cardinals mm -hmm. play holds 63,000 people. Wow. So that facility is not even large enough to only just ha uh, hold the grandparents, much less the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, the adult siblings, and also much less the children. Do we know the percentage of, care, of kinship caregivers that make up, that, that the grandparents make up? It's about 50%. 50%. So 50% of kinship caregivers are grandparents. Yes. Wow. Now, can we uh, continue to elaborate this, the conceptual uh, aspect of kinship? Why is it necessary? What happens to families typically that we know that triggers kinship care? There's an, a number of reasons. It could be economics where parents can't afford to raise them or they um, do some time with drugs to get the money to raise them. But most prevalent, it's the drug issues in the prison that we get them. And um, as grandparents, as a grandparent, I know I had to step up 
because I could not foresee my children being, quote unquote, in the system. Mm. And children thrive better in a family, a familiar uh, setting. It's more stable. Um, you know, they, they don't change schools as often. They don't, they have trust issues and attachment issues. And, you know, they, they typically stay longer with uh, a family than in a group home or foster home. How bad is, how, how difficult is this problem in Arizona in terms of, is uh, teenagers having kids a big issue? You mentioned drugs, uh, drug abuse or substance abuse. <laughs> Uh, finances, uh, all these kinds of uh, elements. Um, it could be financial. It could be teen pregnancy. Um, and not most, un- probably most uncommon people don't normally think about, but um, our military in the last 10 to 15 years, um, OEF and IEF and, you know, families having to go away and grandparents and other relatives having to mm-hmm. care for these children. Um, also mental health issues, um, substance abuse, as you mentioned, and um, you know, um, a parent, a death, a, you know, a parent could have an illness and, and pass away and a grandparent or another relative would have to step up. But I think the two most uncommon uh, that folks don't think about would be the military deployment mm. um, and immigration issues. As we know, in Arizona, that's um, that's a big issue. And so, with, so with military, people decide to serve uh, their country and they go out and then that's more of a not so it doesn't have a negative uh, not a negative, but a problem behind it is more of a, just a need, and then right. people stepping up, right? Right, and I and I mention that only because um, it's not always abuse and neglect, and and of course that that is that is a big issue, and that can trigger um, obviously triggers um, kinship care, but um, when you think of families that are that are being deployed, sometimes um, moms and dads are being deployed together, and um, often. Um, come back um if if hopefully they do come back healthy and whole if they don't if they're coming back with some sort of post-traumatic stress or maimed or any way or um god forbid death um these family members are having to step up so yes that doesn't have a negative connotation as as so much as abuse and neglect and um substance abuse um but mental health is also a big issue as well now ursula uh, you work for the department of child safety it used to be the Department of Protective Services, and that's why yeah. I thought it was there were two entities, but no, it changed from the Department of Protective Services to the Department of Child Safety, and you work for them. What is your 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 um, your perception? I mean, you you work doing this every every day. Yes. What is your? How do you feel about it? What is your perception of what's happening in this realm? And I can speak as. Both a grandparent, I raised. Oh, my that's grandchildren. right. You're also a kinship care, care a yes. kinship caregiver. So I understand the struggles, mm. and I, for many years, I, I, I was an ongoing caseworker. <laughs> so I was able to look at our cases, and the main issues I could see was the substance abuse mm. and mm. mental health issues, and um, causing most of the problems in the families. Mm. And uh, this is one reason I came back to work for DCS as the kinship provider because I, uh, I'm very passionate about mm-hmm. believing that children should stay with family. Mm-hmm. And the department believes that as well. Mm-hmm. And this is why we're in the top in the nation in, in regards to placing the children with family Okay. Mm-hmm. for that consistency, that love, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, not having to deal with all the issues related to being in foster care where children feel um, alone mm-hmm. and abandoned in addition to everything else they have to mm-hmm. go through. Uh, did you take care of one, two, how many grandkids? Two grandchildren and one great-grandson. Okay, okay. Now, you, uh, how about you, uh, Gloria, or Brenda? <laughs> okay. Um, I adopted two of my grandkids in 2009 when they were three and four. They are now... Um, 11 and 12. Mm-hmm. And Aurelia? So my grandson came to me um, through Child Protective Services then. It's now the Department of Child Safety. He was six years old. I raised him for 13 years. He's uh, now 20, out of the home, his own apartment, <laughs> thriving, working um, in construction. And so I had him about 13 years. So si se puede. 
Sí. <laughs> you know, um, I know I, I always uh, try to uh, have a conversation before the, the program over the phone. And I know that I uh, converse with some of you. And you mentioned that there is this concept of formal kinship care and then informal. And, and Laura, you told me that the numbers for informal care, uh, kinship care giving is, is really, we don't really know how many and how big that scope is. Right. I think it's uh, probably a good idea right now to uh, define the terms okay. formal and informal. So formal kinship care is occurring when the family and the child are involved with the Department of Child Safety. Okay. The child is uh, declared a dependent child by the juvenile court in, in, in Arizona, and there's a case manager, a case is opened, and basically the agency is pretty much actually in charge of decision-making for that child. The, the, and so it's the state then that places the child, that allows the child to be placed with a relative. That's formal kinship care. And it turns out that about 20% of all the kinship cases are formal. And the most recent statistic I have is that we have in Arizona uh, 6,871 that might be a little high. About over 6,000, close to 7,000 uh, kids in the formal system. These are, right. yeah. So these are children that are part of the Department of Child Safety. Now, the informal kinship care occurs when, say, uh, you know, my daughter has to go to uh, school in Florida for a few months, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I take care of her kids. It's just between us. We make an arrangement. Right. Any anything that is made an arrangement between a family members is called informal care. Mm. And of all the kinship care that occurs in Arizona, eighty percent percent wow are these informal situations. Now, can I, can we say that it, within the informal, there's lots of uh, care being provided in more difficult situations than just someone going to school, but the family members do not want to get involved with the government. They just mm -hmm. do not want to go there. That's right. There's, uh, it's both. Okay. But, yes, it, uh, it's not all uh, a pleasant situation. Right. And, in fact, a lot of, and you guys can probably talk about this, uh, lots of times there's a lot of back and forth over a number of years of kids. Right. It usually isn't just a phone call out of the clear blue sky that, you know, there's a need, uh, that the children need a, to have a home. Usually there's a, a period of months and years of the children needing a place back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. I have to, uh, we have to go on break. Uh, you're listening to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Subject today is kinship care in Arizona. We'll be right back. Welcome to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. This is AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. The subject today is kinship care in Arizona. And again, kinship is basically care uh, that is provided uh, by a family member when the uh, biological uh, parents are not able to take care of a child, for example. And uh, let's move now to the, the profile of a caregiver. Who is? Uh, maybe we can say a little, again, uh, how many are providing, but who are they? And what kind of challenges does that bring in when the unexpected happens? You're not expecting it. If you're a grandparent, maybe you're already retired. You're enjoying your retirement. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, you, you, you are tasked, if you will, with the care of grandkids that you did not expect but that you love and you hate to see them 
uh, go somewhere else. So let's talk about the profile of the caregiver. Okay, I have some demographics on the formal caregivers. Okay. Now, the informal caregivers, even though there are so many of them, we really don't know who they are. So we don't know much about them, but we do know a lot about uh, the formal. And uh, two, two main things I have is, well, first of all, about um, 59% of them in Arizona are in Maricopa County. Hmm. And 22% are in Pima. Um, ethnically, 38% Hispanic, 34% Caucasian, 13% African American. And age wise, it turns out that about 50% of the formal caregivers are over 50, and 50% are under. We have, there are some, uh, 10% are from 21 to 30. 16% are from 31 to 40, 23% are from 41 to 50, 31% are from 51 to 60, and 20% are over 61. So basically 50% are 50 plus, like based on obviously yes. on those numbers. Yes, and That's that amazing. has a lot to do with the circumstances, the life circumstances of the people that has a lot to do with their ability and their needs regarding caregiving. And the kinship caregivers would be uh, able to tell right. you the details about that aspect of it. Uh, Ursula, can you uh, begin to share a little bit about your experience? I'm sure you were not expecting it. Uh, how soon did it come to you and, and how was that experience of all of a sudden finding yourself, uh, you know, with the need of taking care of grandkids? I Yes, I was not expecting it. But, however, like so many, uh, I think, families in, in Arizona, you struggle when you find out that your child is addicted. Mm. So it had to do with drug use. It has to do with my daughter's addiction. And I took the grandchildren. The DCS did not. <laughs> so, okay, okay. Uh, because I felt they needed to be stable and safe. Mm. The struggles were with the family dynamics, of course. Some family members weren't happy. Mm. My daughter wasn't happy at times. So uh, the families are dealing with friction within the family units mm. uh, and opposition. And then the additional financial burdens mm. of daycare, the extra groceries, the extra everything else that you everything have extra, to provide. Pretty everything much. extra, yeah. yes. So um, that is a very real struggle, especially if you're a single parent and you're taking on you know, extra children and you still have other children. When you first uh, get involved, do you have this, the, are you thinking that this is probably going to be short-term, long-term, forever? What is that experience? I think we all have hope. That it will be short term. Yes, okay. especially if it involves our children and our family. Right, right. There's always that hope. You know, if we just try, they're going to be better. If we just do what's what's needed, mm-hmm. everything's going to work out okay. We're always basing everything on hope because mm-hmm. we love right, right. our children. Right. Um, but that is not really not a reality. Mm-hmm. Right. How about Joaquin? Okay, both of you have been care uh, kinship caregivers. Yeah. How about your experience when it uh, came to you? Mine was. A formal. I got the call. The police were called. Um, DCS was there. They removed it. The, um, at the time, I had four grandchildren from the home. And um, what Ursula was talking about, I like to term tug of war of the heart. Yes. We love our biological children, but our our concern at that moment is for our grandchildren. Mm. And a lot of the biological children think we push them away. Well, we kind of do because we are giving a strict rule through CPS on, you know, no um, visits, no contact with parents unless supervised or mandated, you know, knowing. And a lot of grand, especially grandmothers, have a problem with that because, oh, my my kids can't be that bad. What's seeing the kids going to do? It could have them removed from your home. Mm -hmm. And so we have that pressure on us. The kids are scared, confused. You know, they just seen their mom and dad and the police at the worst time. So we get them when they're kind of traumatized. And we're 
we can't break down. Mm. We can't. We just have to be strong, and just you know keep our emotions in check because of the situation. Right. And Aurelia, your experience. So I'd like to add on to um, Brenda's doing a great job of explaining um, clinical emotional issues that kinship caregivers, the birth parents, and the children are going through. Mm. She um, eloquently explained um, split loyalties. Um, she talked about this tug of war in her heart. Um, so, you, you know, and, and Ursula explained some of that too. We, we love our birth children. Our first um, connection is to our birth child. Mm-hmm. And so when our grandchildren or relative children are placed with us, it causes some split loyalties when, um, you know, we're not able wow. to um, be able to supervise visits or have the birth parents come over when they're not supposed to. So that's a huge clinical issue that the children are feeling that, the birth parents are feeling it, and the okay, caregivers Okay, so if I'm understanding feeling- this correctly, now the grandparents and the parents are basically... The, or the grandparents are managing how much the the kids see their parents. Absolutely. And they have to stick to strict rules. So sometimes that that's a difficult situation to manage. It's a huge difficult situation if the caregivers have is giving the the task of supervising the visits. And often the department will ask that. And hopefully, if the care if it becomes um, you know diff, too difficult, that the, the caregiver can ask for some assistance. Um, you talked a lot about grief and loss. We talked about hope. Um, you know, we want to have hope for our children. We want to be able to um, take care of our grandchildren when needed, but we also want to be able to have hope that our birth children will be able to yes. care for their children, right? And so um, there, are, there are so many clinical issues going on, and um, it, it, it's really hard. It's difficult. Do we know how many, or at least percentage-wise, of the children eventually – uh, get their situation in, in order and then come back and are they able to retake the custody if I I don't know if I'm using the right terminology of their children or is we don't see many cases like that of children who are able to take the custody back personally I don't have the statistics but in the years as of working as a case manager uh, I do believe that I would hope the percentage could be higher but dealing with the addiction, and as we're looking at the opioid crisis now, right. I mean, it started way right, back. Right, right, right. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes it's too ingrained uh, into the families, and they're not able to mm. change. So, um, but they do have a chance, and they're given every opportunity with the services that the department provides um, to work through their issues and stabilize and have the children return to them. Right. They have to meet the certain criteria, mm-hmm. of course, and they have to show and prove that the children are going to be safe. Mm. And we do provide, even after the children are returned home, we're still supervised to an extent to ensure that it's going to maintain. Right, right. Mm-hmm. David, I also wanted to mention some other um, things that could be difficult for kinship caregivers. Um, obviously, we mentioned supervising visits, um, navigating the systems. <clears throat> When I was raising my grandson, I'm navigating the systems, and I and I see um, Ursula and Gloria, uh, Brenda. Can nodding. you be more specific about the systems? What uh, that entails? Sure. So when my um, so like many other caregivers, when my grandson came to me, I didn't have much time to make a decision, and he came to me with the clothes on his back, and so I did not have his medical card. I did not have his um, you know any of his meds, his backpack, his school clothes. I didn't have. He came with the clothes on his back, and so mm. what I found is that I had to navigate many systems. And what I mean by that is there was the court system. There was the department, um, the court system, there was the medical system, the behavioral health system, the school system. My grandson um, came with special needs. He needed an IEP, which is an individual education plan. Mm -hmm. Had to navigate that system. And so navigating so many systems that work um, in silos, not so much together. Um, Not to mention not understanding the department's language. Um, And they were tremendous and very helpful, but not understanding the acronyms and going to court and not understanding um you know what the what the plan really was and 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 i really did believe it was short term and as you can see it was for me it was 13 years wow so this involves schools finances buying clothes uh making sure that you understand what uh, insurance if any they have most likely mm-hmm. they probably will have but if you still have to become familiar with
with all those uh, items. Go ahead. Um, Aurelia got her son at six. I got Anthony. Um, when, actually, it, it, he yo-yoed back. They removed him from the home, placed him with me, then gave him back. And so it went back and forth. Um, I did not know the issues that were going to come up because a lot of times you're, you don't, you're not told the background. Mm. You're not told – you're told basically minimal amount. Right. It's like need to know. Um, Anthony had, is in the behavior health system, and that's another – um, navigational thing and um, thank God we you know now we we moved along we've had pioneers it's easier to navigate um, and we learned how we could talk to our caseworker and not be afraid to remove the kids because a lot of grandparents don't want to tell the problems to the caseworker for fear that you're too old you can't handle the kids mm. Um, so therefore, maybe this isn't a great placement. Mm-hmm. So we've got all these thoughts going right. on. We want to help our kids. We want to help our grandkids. So right. it just, it's overwhelming because you're given a packet and go like, here, basically, bye. And we're going to uh, be talking about the policy and procedures in the next segment. Stay with us. You're listening to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. We'll be right back. Welcome to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. The subject today is kinship care in Arizona. You're listening to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection a platform that educates uh, on very important issues. We educate, we celebrate, and we connect communities. Uh, We have uh, special guests today addressing this uh, uh, issue of kinship care. Some of them uh, work for government entities, others are caregivers, and others work for uh, agencies that uh, specialize, if you will, in this uh, field. Uh, Can we address now the policy and procedures? I know that the the Department of... uh, Child safety mm-hmm. intervenes, and they are basically the ones that take care of placing children yes. in relatives' care. Uh, obviously, that must be a very, very um, rigorous process, and that it has a lot of involves, uh, involvements, uh, moving parts. Can you, uh, Ursula, try to uh, at least summarize what that process is like? Yes, it is very. Um, it can be very stressful for the families. However, the department is always trying to find family first to place these children with once they have been removed from their parents. So how do you um, hear about cases first? The hotline has... Somebody calls, yeah, calls your number hotline. and says there's this child in danger, Yes, for example. and there has to be an investigation okay. done and a determination made whether that child is safe or whether that child has to be removed from the home. And that is the investigative unit takes care of all that and has to make that decision based on our procedures and, and laws. So sometimes if the case is a little risky or risky, they literally take the child immediately from the parent. If there's an immediate danger, yes. Okay. And what do you do with the child at that point? Oftentimes, it depends on the situation. If they have the time to find a family member or the parents can actually identify mm. a family member they would like the child to like, go to. Like a temporary? Yes. Okay. And then they go through the process of assessing uh, uh, they have to where they're going to place. Okay. Yes. We make allowances for kinship folks in regards to how, how many bedrooms and, and the non-safety issues. However, they do have to all um, be fingerprinted. They have to uh, pass the background checks. We do DPS, DCS background checks. Um in order to place the child Are there, there cases where you place a child temporarily in somebody's home and then you, the person who ends up with the custody of that child, it's, it could be somebody else? Yes. Or, okay. So, okay. And then, it, yeah, I mean, the, those are real situations. And sometimes we can place temporarily and perhaps they may not, you know, pass the background check or the family decides, okay, this is too much for us to handle. Mm. Maybe another family member could step up. 
or at times, you know, none of the family members are stepping up or are able to, and then the child is put into so foster So fingerprint, care. Uh, background checks, yes. the, the caregivers, and I understand everyone residing in the home Has to that is 18 and older would, be, uh, would kind of go through the same process just to yes. make sure that the child being placed in that home will be safe yes. and taken care of. Yeah, that is, that is mandatory. If a person in that home refuses to be fingerprinted, we have to remove the child. Mm, okay. So, but yeah. that statue, we have right. no choice there. Of course. Now, I, I still wanted to come back a little bit before we move also to the benefits, because once uh, Department of Child Safety uh, gives uh, or places a child in somebody, a relative's home, there are some benefits involved, and we would like to talk about those as well. What's available? I, uh, Laura, you told me that every case in, uh, with access, uh, which is a, a plan for health, is basically guaranteed in any case that involves uh, kinship care. But uh, can we go back, when, when a, and especially grandparents who may be uh, living in a, in a housing uh, situation where they get benefits, what would happen if, if, if bringing in a child or two causes them to break a rule do they would they have to be you know moved to another location i mean anybody can speak to that by any chance so i'll i'll start and then let brenda um sort of add to it so um in working with a lot of the grandparents over the years and helping them navigate the systems um yeah there are a lot of um difficulties such as a grandparent living in senior housing and now she gets some children and that breaks the rules of mm -hmm. of the senior housing and now she has to move and financially maybe on a fixed income um Gloria, brenda you mentioned um having to lose a lose a job um i when i first got my kids I was working, I had a really nice job, and um, because of the interruptions with CPS, the doctor's appointment, the court dates, I was um, laid off. Mm. And um, you, Because yeah. you were missing too much? I was missing too many days. Um, of course, you know, as grandparents, we don't have the luxury of taking our kids to the grandparents if they're sick. We have to stay home with them mm. because we are... So if you were on a, on a nice path to a nice retirement preparation, you know, getting all your uh, ducks mm -hmm. in a row, as they say, to, and then all of a sudden you have to literally stop that and take care of it, and then your retirement uh, security, if you will, is in jeopardy. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to have savings account, vacation account, you know, all this Christmas account. Now I have one bank account, and, a, and I joke, if I have $5 left in it in a month, that was a successful wow. month. Wow! Wow! Hmm. Yeah, and I think, and I think for me, um, having to start over again, um, having raised um, children, and now having a grandchildren, a grandchild in my home, having to start over again, being a single parent, and and um, yeah, not being able to put into, I was still of working age, but not being able to put into retirement or savings because now all the money is being used to raise this child. So all the money that you were planning to uh, put on say, uh, for, for the future for saving for retirement, now you have to uh, use to take care of your grandkid. And I assume that this happens in many, many, many cases. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, going back to the procedures. So, um, what, so how the, the process then is an assessment is done on the families who are going to be taking care yes. of the new uh, child. And then um, once they, uh, how long does it take for, uh, for approval? They have to be fingerprinted within 15 days. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, we, they, they wait for the, I bet the children can be there in the home while we're awaiting the results. Um, and then the court has to prove the placement, of course. Um, it is a process, and like the ladies were saying, working with DCS can be intimidating and overwhelming, mm -hmm. and we understand that. Um, and it is our goal to constantly improve communication and uh, talk to the families and teach them what they're up against ahead of time. Uh, we have a kinship booklet that we just updated uh, to provide some of that information and start those conversations. Is that uh, online as well? Yes, it's online. What is the website? DCS.gov. As, as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I do want to say that on our website, I was able to move kinship actually up front. 
Hmm. Um, we have a lot of information that is helpful. Good. Uh, there's also the policy there. If someone wants to look at our policy, right. they can look it up. So um, if they go to um, uh, DES, DCS, or DCS.gov, yes. uh, they'll, see, they'll find right away something about kinship yeah. right there. Yeah, the website is going to pop up, mm -hmm. and you have all these other uh, these options to look at, whether it's kinship care, foster and adoption, and you click on... Uh, the area, and you will find all kinds of information that will be helpful in, in any of the questions you are trying to find. Right. Let's uh, talk about, before we go on our last break, about the benefits that are available for caregivers. Uh, again, Lori, you told me that uh, access uh, it's, is basically guarantee for, uh, for the children, correct? Yeah. I, actually, the, when we're talking about the benefits that are available, uh, the benefit eligibility is dependent on if these children are in an inf informal situation or a formal situation. Okay. okay. So we're saying 80% are in an informal situation. Mm -hmm. And so that's what most of the foster care children are in Arizona. So basically the government has no base, uh, legal base, to provide any help if they are in an informal Well, if it's an scenario. informal uh, situation because the children aren't living with their parents, they access uh, uh, medical care will be provided. Of course, you have to apply for it if the child doesn't have it yet. Um, it is possible to apply for something called um, temporary assistance for needy families, which is a, which is a cash uh, right. situation. Um, for one child, it's $164. But for the informal families, um, there is a neediness test, a financial mm. neediness test. And basically, anybody that works would probably not. It, it's the caregiver's right. income. They'll exceed the limit. Yes, so that's usually not available. Uh, also, um, child care is also uh, a ne uh, needed a lot. And there are long waiting lists mm. and eligibility criteria for that. And one other need that the informal caregivers have that the formals don't is legal assistance. Mm. Um, as we mentioned, the child in a formal situation is a dependent child and everything is laid out uh, as far as the legal situation. But if it's an informal situation, I'm just taking care of my grandchildren for a while, I have to have some ability that gives me the right to take them to medical care, mm. to enroll them in school. And that's school. my question. So what kind of documentation do they have to prove? Because they're informal. The government hasn't <laughs> issued any, uh, any placement. So what documentation can they show so, to the, to they can, so they can apply for access, they can move them to schools? I mean, what do they show, the informal ones? Well, I know that, yeah, the, the parents can, can sign over a power of attorney. Okay. Power of attorney. So that's basically the, the common uh, way by which the parents who are in a, or the, the care, kinship caregivers in an informal uh, deal with all these kinds of issues. Yes, David, that's one way. Okay. So when I worked with informal kinship caregivers, we would um, ask the birth parents to sign a uh, power of attorney. Okay. And it's not a legal document. It's good for six months and it can be revoked at any time, but mm. it could help in the instance of getting medical care okay. and getting the child enrolled in school. Okay. Another way is to go through um, the court system to get a, a guardianship, not through the department. Mm. A title 14 mm. is another way. So guardianship is different than the status that one gets through a placement through DCS. Mm. Yes. Yes. It's different. Yes. So, what is the status then that the DC uh, DCS uh, of, uh, grants? When it comes to the point of making a decision in regards to the permanency of the child, there are the options of guardianship. Guardianship. Um, with the exception that with DCS, it's a Title VIII guardianship. Mm. And the difference is with the Title XIV, the parent can go to court any day and revoke that guardianship. Okay. With the Title VIII, through our agency, they will have to go back to the family court and prove Got it. that they have changed the situation. Right. So it is more of a secure type of guardianship. Yeah. Time is flying. We have to go on our last break. You're listening to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. We'll be right back. Welcome to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. 
Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Thank you for staying with us. This is our last segment of this program on kinship care in Arizona. Very uh, difficult uh, subject uh, on the one hand, uh, and it just uh, brings forth the love of family uh, on the other, uh, but it nonetheless a difficult experience. Uh, I haven't asked about your impressions about the impact that all this has on children. I assume Feel free to mention a little bit in the next segment. Uh, that's something I would like to kind of take, uh, you know, hear from you as to the impact, uh, short term, long term, and then uh, what are the supporting systems that we have? What who is supporting the, these groups of caregivers and then the children, and then uh, prevention? What are we going to? What are we doing? What is out there that is trying to prevent all this? From continuing, so uh, let's start with uh, with the impact and then supporting entities. So what uh, entities, organizations uh, are supporting uh, these efforts? So it's a huge impact on children. Um, I can um, I have story after story with my grandson where um, there is tons of grief and loss. I mean, our family was grieving. You know, my daughter was grieving that she lost her son, and I was grieving that I was having to raise a grandchild. Mm -hmm. I was grieving for my daughter, and my grandson was grieving. Um, and um, anger. Um, mm -hmm. Anger. There's lots of anger and resentment and um, um, role, um, role changes. And so I go from um, being Nana, fun Nana, and Chucky cheesing him up, you mm -hmm. know, every weekend to now I'm parenting. Disciplining. Right, sometimes. disciplining. Now right. it's like, where's your homework? Get in the bath, get mm -hmm. to bed. Mm -hmm. And so one day um, my grandson says to me, what, what happened to fun Nana? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there are a lot of... There are a lot of um, implications. Um, um, Long term, I mean, I assume that it has to have an impact in, in a child, obviously. So, so I'm glad you mentioned that because long term it, it does. And I think Ursula sort of touched on this. Um, when you take in a grandchild and it goes to permanency, I know we didn't touch on permanency on, on this segment, but um, it really does change the child's role on the genogram, on the mm. family tree. And mm. so if um, in the case of Brenda, where she adopted her grandchildren, mm -hmm. it puts them on the same line mm. of her birth, yeah. of her birth wow. children. And so it, it does. It causes um, it, 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 it can cause a lot of family dysfunction in, in the do they come back from school and, and do you sense that even at school they probably feel like people yes. mm, mistreat them? Um, it's changing. I I have two sons, and they're different as night, night and day. Um, Anthony, if you ask him about his mom, he'll shut down because he's thinking of his birth mom. Mm. Gaby will go with it. I mean, he had to do a timeline, and it's like I learned to speak at such and such time. And, and my, my nana adopted me in 2009, and then he went on. Mm. Anthony could not get past the point of the adoption. It would traumatize them so much to think about it it you know it, it's the temperament of the kids um how you deal with it i have a great relationship with their with my son now mm -hmm. but it took a long time and a lot of support groups and a lot of parenting groups to to where we can communicate but it's not the same mm. he knows the power switch or if you want to right. call that and he knows that if he does something I can always say, you know, you can't see him anymore. Right. And um, I have to, I mean, we're not going to address this issue, but just uh, mm -hmm. mention it uh, briefly. This is what a lot of times teachers are, are dealing with as well, right? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I assume that a high percentage of students come to classrooms with this kind of difficult situations, and now teachers have to teach kids that are that have so much in their mind and, and you know so i like to mention something here not to diminish any trauma that the family goes through associated with kinship care but i would like to to bring up the context of the child that doesn't go to kinship care the trauma that the child uh suffers going to live with strangers mm. and maybe it's not even going to be temporary maybe it's going to be forever Maybe it's going to be one foster home after another. 
maybe siblings are going to be in different homes mm. because one foster home only wants school age kids and there are little kids in the family too so there's that mm. there's the the thing of feeling like a stranger of being with people that don't look like you, of not having shared stories. Mm -hmm. So that even though for the hardship that everybody um, um, is subject to in kinship care, it is so much better for the children. Because in in a foster care situation, sometimes children totally lose their families forever. Okay, so you're bringing in another concept. So there is the kinship care and then foster care? Foster care is the is the alternative. If no kinship caregiver I see. steps up. Okay. So the concept is the same in terms of the a, a child needing a care, and someone, a, safe a family place to take to be. care. Yep. But it could go in the route of kinship or foster where there's, it'll be an, a, a person they don't know. So we're saying there are about 46% of the formal care uh, kids are in foster care mm. with kin. Wow. And that means that there's... 54%, my math is bad, I think that's right, there are 54% of kids in foster care that are now living with strangers. Wow. Now, uh, can we uh, briefly uh, mention the organizations? I know, obviously, uh, Department of uh, Child Safety is the government entity that takes care of it, but without the nonprofit community organization support system, this is this would be even uh, more difficult. Can we talk about some of those organizations that are in the valley and beyond? So I want to um, start with an umbrella of agencies. And so um, the Central Arizona Kinship Care Coalition has, Ursula, can you help me, maybe 14 agencies that yes. show up on a bi-monthly basis that um, offer services and resources to kinship families. And the Central Arizona Kinship Care Coalition's website is www.azkincare.org. Yes. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly touch on um, Duet is a good resource. Um, um, Arizona's Children is a good resource. And you guys can pipe up if you... Um, Arizona, uh, no, Children Action Alliance, uh, what do they do? Do they also, I mean, they don't specialize in this area, but they do kind of like yeah. an, more uh, overall uh, advocacy. Okay. Yes. Advocacy, policy, legislation. But as it relates to children. As it relates to children and kinship Perfect. care is on their radar as well. Okay. Okay. Um, so there are several agencies. If you were to go to that website that I mentioned to find the list of the agencies that are a part of the um, Kinship Care Coalition, there is also, I'm sorry, David, there's also um, the Arizona Grandparent Ambassadors. Oh, that, that, that is that, a statewide yes. um, coalition. Um, and um, for Tucson, there's the Care Center in Tucson. So do we have information in the uh, Central Arizona Kinship Care Coalition website, which is azkincare.org, uh, <coughs> in there from other places? That is, you said you use the word umbrella. So if people go to this one, would they find lots of information about what's going on in other uh, uh, places or areas of the state and entities, organizations, etc.? cetera? Not of the state. This, it's, this is for Central for Arizona. For Central Arizona. So this, okay. Uh, so do you have anything on your website that uh, list, gives a list of resources, a- agencies at all? Uh, we have some, but you can Google, uh, like the 211, mm-hmm. and you can find community resources okay. that uh, actually assist with utilities that in uh, different areas. And then I'm working with Pima as well. They have a couple of agencies that... Um, will provide bedding mm-hmm. and clothing for children in foster care, mm-hmm. and they work specifically with kin. The same as, like, Arizona Helping Hands for foster kids, they provide beds right. uh, for the kinship folks, <clears throat> which is very, very helpful. I think we would be lost without having mm-hmm. those agencies to assist us. Right. Go ahead. Um, I'm more, as a grandparent, I'm looking for support systems, for, and we... we I don't know if we're going to touch on preventative, but Family Involvement Center offers Mm -hmm. um, lots of advice on for the parents who have lost the kids and trying to get them back. They um, they educate them for educational, like the you know the difference between the five hundred four and the IEP and legal. They will support 
the grandparents and the parents. Do you think there is a need to to still uh, synchronize, if for lack of a better term, synchronize the services, the support systems in our state? Oh, yes. Uh, and, I, and I really want to uh, ask you to use this platform, come to me anytime you want, mm-hmm. to see how this platform can help, can help to synchronize. Because I, I believe in synchronizing Systems because a lot of times people are doing their things that are great, but then the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, kind of thing. So please use this platform and, and let's okay. continue to move. I believe when I used to go to those meetings, and I, I'm going to do my best to, uh, to resume attending those meetings. Um, it is, uh, I always uh, saw the need to synchronize, to, to kind of uh, create like a platform that uh, where people can go and find pretty much everything that they need to know. So the next coalition meeting for the Central Arizona Kinship Care Coalition is Wednesday, March 21st at, from 11 to 1 p.m. at Casey Family Programs down the street. Right. So you're welcome to attend, David. Yes. And, and again, the, 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 those meetings uh, or the information about those meetings can be found at AZ Kin Care, I assume, uh, the azkincare.org. That's where people can find information about contacts, agencies, the meetings that the, of the Central Arizona Kinship Care Coalition. Uh, we have a few seconds. Uh, please, uh, if anybody wants to add just anything, uh, do so in about five to ten seconds each. So I just want um, folks to know um, the department, um, anyone working with kinship caregivers, I want them to know that it's a sacrifice, but it's a joy at the same time. I want them to know that you, they can partner with kinship caregivers. Let us know what's going on. Give us court dates. Um, make us party to the case if you can. I want you to know that what Brenda talked about, the split loyalties, it's hard. Um, but, you know, we do it anyway. And I want them to know that we love our grandchildren, but we love our birth children as well. And we want you to have hope for us as we have hope. Right. And it, it is a journey, but it is a nice journey. We, I live a totally different life now. Um, before I was a wreck. With the help of my mentors, and a lot of them are in this room, um, help me to speak, to know our voice is important. And we have to remember that, that with um, a lot of people, it's power, but it takes one person to start the movement. Thank you. Uh, we run out of time. Thank you uh, to everyone who joined our guests. You did an, an amazing job. Thank you. And uh, we really hope that you found this program uh, helpful. Uh, you listen to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Have a great week.